Good. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So glad you could be here. Um, yeah, this is obviously the Latin X and AI and Black and AI joint gathering, and we're going to get started with our keynote speaker. And before that, we'd just like to once again thank everyone for coming and our sponsors, Facebook and Intel. And yeah, so first speaker would be Dr. Pablo Castro. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for waking up on time. I had a hard time um, pretty early. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad um, this is happening. Uh, so I am Pablo. I work in uh, Google Brain in Montreal. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of my research uh, in sequential decision making. So just briefly, a little bit about my history. So I was born in Quito, Ecuador, and I moved to Montreal to pursue my studies, uh, eventually doing a PhD focusing on reinforcement learning and sequential decision making. And I had a, like a five-year hiatus out of research, uh, and then I rejoined research about two years ago uh, when I joined Brain in Montreal. And now I have two main uh, research uh, fo focuses. One is fundamental reinforcement learning, which is what I'll talk about today, and the other is machine learning and creativity, which I'll be talking about at 1 p.m. in room nine. Um, so if you're not going on the cruise, you can come check it out. Um, <clears throat> so just briefly, some of the projects I'm involved with uh, in reinforcement learning is uh, this library that we built for, for fast uh, and flexible reinforcement learning research called Dopamine, which I was talking about yesterday. If you're into reinforcement learning research, I encourage you to check it out. Um, I do also some other more theoretical work on trying to understand uh, distributional reinforcement learning, why it works, why it doesn't, what situations uh, make it work well compared to the traditional way of doing reinforcement learning. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of my more recent work, um, which is uh, shown here. Um, so this work was recently rejected from ICML, um, but a shorter version will, will appear in uh, the Reinforcement Learning and Decision Making Conference in Montreal in July, and um, hopefully longer versions in other places too, if the reviewers are nice. Um, okay, so it focuses on, on uh, Markov decision processes, which are the fundamental mathematical formalism underlying most of the reinforcement learning algorithms that, that you hear about today. But in general, they're a mathematical formalism for modeling decision-making processes. And so they consist of a set of states, a set of actions, a set of rewards, um, some transition dynamics, and a discount factor. Um, so I like to explain things with, with drawings and, and images. So I drew this hungry cat thing um, that's trying to find a path to get food. So you can see there's, there's some little crumbs here. There's a cage where if he gets into the cage, he won't get any food, so he'll be fun hungry. And there's a stash of canned food, and that's really what, what he wants to get to. So in the silly example, um, the states would be the, these nodes where the, where the cat has to make some decisions of whether to go up or down at each point. And these decisions are the actions that the, uh, that the cat has available to him at each state. And so based on where he ends up, he'll receive a numerical reward that indicates how desirable that current state is to the cat. So if there's no food, um, you get a reward of negative one because you're still hungry. If you get these little crumbs, you get a reward of plus one. Um, if you end up in a cage, you get a reward of negative 100 because then you're going to be hungry for a while. And if you get the stash of cans, you get a, a nice big reward. So the transition dynamics describe how the agent moves around these states when, when it makes choices or when it makes these decisions. So in a deterministic system like what we have here, when you go up, you'll just end up in the next state as, as one would expect. But uh, more generally, we typically deal with stochastic transitions. So that means you can imagine, for instance, that when, whatever the agent um, decides to do, there's a 10% chance that he'll slip and end up where he started. So these stochastic transitions make the problem more difficult, but they're, they're more general and, and they, they are able to represent a, large, um, type, uh, a larger type of problem. Um, and finally, we have this discount factor gamma that's a number between zero and one, and its purpose is meant to encourage finding these rewards uh, sooner, so not waiting too long before you get the, the large reward. Um, so typically, we think of this problem, we, we formal, formulate it with uh, what's called the Bell Bellman optimality equation, um, where you can see this, it's a, assigning a value, a numerical value to all the states, and this value is computed by taking the sum of the immediate reward that you receive by performing an action, and the sum of discounted rewards you'll see in the future. So you can see this is a recurrence. Um, we have the, the V um, function appearing on both sides of the equation. Um, so this was introduced uh, back in 1957 by, by Richard Bellman, and actually this is what introduced dynamic programming, which most of you are probably familiar from, from your computer science education. 
um, but it was originally introduced to solve, solve this recurrence. And the traditional way you do it with dynamic programming is you start with some estimate of your value function. So for instance, we can say we're gonna take just the immediate reward as our initial estimate V0. And so you can see um, from this state, the best action you should take is to go down because then you'll get these crumbs and it'll give you a reward of plus one. Here you don't really have a choice and you're gonna end up in the cage anyway, so you get a reward of, of negative 100, et cetera. So our initial estimate V0 just is, is very myopic. It just looks at one step rewards. But then you can use this estimate V0 to compute a new estimate V1. And so here we're looking at one step rewards plus transition into the next state. And if we use a discount factor of 0.9, then you'll end up with these values. So you'll see that the, the optimal action now from the first state is to go up um, because now we can see one step beyond and we can see that if we go down, we're going to end up in the cage. So that's not, not good. So when we go up, um, we'll, uh, we'll have these rewards. Sorry, I'm not including the, the stochastic transitions in this computation, if some of you are confused. Um, but now that we have V1, we can do the same thing and use it to come up with a new estimate for V2. And uh, we end up with, with uh, these values that we have here on the right. Um, and if we do this again, if we apply V2 to compute a new estimate for V3, we're gonna get exactly the same thing. So that means that we've reached the fixed point, which we're guaranteed to reach. So essentially V2 is our V star. And um, from this V star, we can now extract the optimal policy for, for the hungry cat, which is just to go up twice and then go down and he'll reach his uh, stash of rewards. All right, so that's, that's a nice little drawing, but more formally, um, MDPs are defined by this tuple, which are the states, actions, transition dynamics, rewards, and discount factor. And we're typically operating with, with what we call policies, which are mappings from states to a distribution over actions. So for each state, what is the, the action I should choose? Um, sometimes these are just deterministic um, policies. And so for each policy, we can compute um, the, the value for that policy. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a recurrence like, like we were seeing before, but here the actions are not, no longer, we're not maximizing over actions, but we're looking at the expected uh, value we get by sampling from, from our policy. Um, but again, what we're typically interested in is, is the optimality equation because this tells us how to act optimally. Okay, so what, what's important here for the purposes of this talk is all of this, this hinges on this notion of state. So we have these values for states and this is how we can compute how desirable it is to be in a particular state and how to act from that state by looking at the, at the next states. Um, but what are these states? Um, they're, we know they're the central component necessary for planning and learning. Um, if we're dealing with uh, standard uh, environments like Atari or, or some of the, the standard frameworks we look at, we're given these states so we don't have to really think about it. Um, but what we do know is that they need to contain enough information for us to make these Markovian decisions. So what I mean by Markovian is that when you're in a state, you don't have to, you shouldn't have to look into the past to, to be able to act optimally. But who gets to define these states and what's the right way to define these states? This is not something that's very clear, especially if you're designing a new environment. So just as an example, if we have the simple grid world here um, where the, uh, the goal is to reach one of these green states, um, this is a fairly simple problem, but let's say you have an adversary that comes around and says, he just creates a carbon copy of, of that uh, original grid world, and he adds these transitions. So whenever you take an action, you kind of switch back and forth between these two layers. So the dynamics are exactly the same, just that you, you can alternate between being in the top and the bottom layer. Um, so this is kind of bad because we've just doubled the size of the state space for absolutely no reason. So all of the algorithms that we'd use, the complexity goes up and it just makes it a lot harder to plan and to learn in the system um, when we really don't need this, this, this carbon copy. So what we really need is a notion of, of state that captures behavioral indistinguishability. If we were able to do that, then we'd be able to just prune off this top layer because we can see it's completely redundant. And so this is what by simulation relations are, are able to capture quite nicely. Um, the way they're defined is that you take an equivalence relation E and this uh, constitutes a bisimulation relation if whenever it relates two states, um, it relates them because they match on, on one step rewards for all actions and on all actions they have the same probability of transitioning into equivalence classes given by your equivalence relation E. And so we'll say two states S and T are bisimilar if there exists some bisimulation relation that, that relates them. So again, I think um, drawings are, are easier to understand than, than these types of definitions. So if we have, um, like as a simple example, let's say we have this, the seven state MDP, where it's a single action and you have rewards of zero everywhere except at the rightmost states where you have a reward of one. 
Well, we can use a similar dynamic programming type algorithm to compute these by simulation equivalence classes. And the way it proceeds is we first split off states by immediate reward. So in this case, all of these states on the left will get clumped together because they all receive an immediate reward of zero. Um, the states on the right will receive an immediate reward of one, so they get grouped separately. Now that we have this estimate, we can use uh, this to s further refine these, these equivalence classes by looking at transition dynamics. So we can see that the states on the right remain in the same equivalence class, so they don't get, have to be split off. But we can see that X3 and X4 are these frontier states that are transitioning into a different equivalence class. So they get split off, whereas these guys, they, they remain in the original blue equivalence class, so they don't get split off. And we can repeat this process and see that now X1 and X2 are new frontier states, so they'll get split off. And you end up with these uh, equivalence classes, which again, we've reached a fixed point that we're guaranteed to reach. And these are, are by simulation equivalence classes. So what this tells us is that we can essentially um, combine these states in each equivalence class and end up with a four state MDP rather than a seven state MDP, which can often lead to, to pretty nice savings. Um, because th these states in each equivalence class are essentially behaviorally indistinguishable. Um, so that's kind of cool, but these equivalence relations can be kind of brittle. So if you look at this system here and we're trying to figure out whether X1 and X2 are bisimilar or not, um, you can see that they have the same reward of zero, and if P were equal to Q, they'd have exactly the same transition dynamics, so they would be bisimilar. However, if, if you're estimating these transitions from data, which you often do, um, the likelihood that they'll match exactly numerically is, is, is very low. And so you'll end up saying that these states are not bisimilar, even though they, they truly are, which is kind of unfortunate. So what we really need are, are pseudometrics that can generalize equivalence relations. And so what I mean by this is that the kernel would, would still give you bisimulation equivalence uh, relations, but they're a smoother um, uh, notion of similarity rather than just this zero one uh, notion that we have with, with equivalence relations. And so for this, we're going to use the Wasserstein metric, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, so the Wasserstein, it's a metric on probability distributions given some metric between states. So if we have a metric D, that's uh, some distance between states and an MDP, um, we can then lift that onto a metric uh, on probability distributions over the, the state space. So um, we can compute this using linear programming. This is what we call the, the primary linear program, um, which also admits a dual formulation, which I have here. And I actually like this dual formulation um, quite a bit more because it has a nice intuitive interpretation um, that I'll show you now. So for computing this metric, one way you could do it is, um, as I said, we, we're trying to compute the distance between two probability distributions, and these are distributions over the state space. So we can take one copy of the state space on the left, and then another copy of the state space on the right, and we fully connect these two, these two copies of the state space um, with these edges. And so these edges have unlimited capacity, but they have a cost. And the cost is given by the distance between the two states that the edge is connecting. Okay? And then here we have um, the source node that has edges connecting it to all the states on the left. And these edges have no cost, but they have a capacity. And the capacity is given by mu, or the distribution, um, the, the probability mass that's assigned to that state. Um, and similarly, on the, on the other side, we have edges connecting the, the right-hand side states to the sync node um, with no cost, but with a capacity of new. And so if you think of the source and the sync node as two states in your MDP that you're trying to, to compare against, mu is, is the transition dynamics from the state on the left, and new is the state, uh, transition dynamics from the state on the right. And what we're trying to do essentially is push a unit of water, and it's a unit because this is a probability distribution, so it'll add, it'll add to one. And then this will fill these nodes with, with different um, capacities of water. And we have to reshuffle this, this, this fluid so that it, it can fill up the nodes over here so that we get a unit of water going into the sink. Um, and the way we reshuffle it, um, it the, how much it costs is given by, by the cost of these edges. And so we're trying to find the minimum way of reshuffling this water um, so that, that we can essentially reconstruct our probability distribution. And so this we can solve as a minimum cost flow problem um, with this complexity. So that, um, that's the, the interpretation of the dual formulation of the, of the Wasserstein. And we can use it to define a bisimulation metric. So a bisimulation metric is simply any metric that, that gives us, um, when, when two states are, have distance zero, they're going to be bisimilar under the notion of, of equivalence relation that I presented earlier. And we can compute a bisimulation metric using this functional f where it takes um, the, when it's comparing two states, it looks at their difference in reward function, and then it looks at this Wasserstein distance between their next, uh, next state transition dynamics. So you can see this is 
fairly similar to the Bellman um, optimality equation that I introduced at, at the beginning of the talk. And there is quite a, a, a strong similarity there. Um, so if we apply this functional, we, we can show that it has a greatest fixed point and that this point, the fixed point is a bisimulation metric. But what's nice is that this functional also gives us a way of computing the metric in, with dynamic programming in a similar way as we did with the, with the Bellman optimality equation, where we start with some initial estimate and we apply this functional um, a bunch of times until we reach a fixed point or, or until we've converged uh, to, to an, uh, an approximate that's good enough. So what's nice about these metrics is that once we have the metric, the distance between two states is an upper bound on the, the difference between their optimality equations. So what this means is that if we were to use this metric for, to collapse states that are, say, within epsilon distance of each other, that means that we can guarantee that the, the error in, in estimating the optimal value functions will be bounded by epsilon, which is kind of nice. Um, the problem is that when using this dynamic programming method for computing the metric, for each pair of states and each action, you have to compute this Wasserstein metric, which is very expensive. And so you end up with this complexity that you have here, which is quite large. And so this is what I started looking into. Um, most of my work in my PhD was looking at this stuff, but very much on the theoretical side of things, so we didn't really care that much about uh, computation. Um, but I've started thinking more about that now. And so one of the things, because this Wasserstein is so expensive, I, I started thinking, what if we get rid of consider deterministic systems. So there's no stochastic transitions, there are deterministic transitions. And you see this with a lot of the environments that people look at nowadays, like um, Atari and Mujoku and those types of things. What's nice is that I'm able to show that if, if you use a deterministic uh, MDP, then you can essentially replace the Wasserstein, the expensive Wasserstein, with simply the distance between the unique next states, which I denote by, by this N. So now we can rewrite our, our functional F um, that, that I introduced before by getting rid of the Wasserstein and just using as the, the distance between the, the unique next states. And so this makes it a lot easier to compute. Um, so one of the, the issues with the dynamic programming method of computing these, these metrics is that when you start with some estimate D0 um, and you're going to compute the, the next estimate, what you have to do is look at all state pairs and all actions, and that'll give you your next estimate D1. And then from D1, you again look at all state action pairs and all actions, and you get D2. And so looking at all the state uh, in, the, in this way, it can be very expensive, especially if you're dealing with large state spaces. So um, what, I was, what I'm proposing is that instead of looking at all state action pairs, you just look at uh, pair, sample pairs of transitions. So you can imagine if you have a replay buffer, this is something where you can sample these transitions kind of independently. And so we're going to say that all these uh, pairs of transitions live in, in some set tau. And so at step n, when, for, for this algorithm that I'm proposing, you sample one of these pairs of transitions and you're going to update your current uh, metric estimate in the following way. You're going to keep the same estimate that you had before if your states, the pairs of states that you're looking at are not in your transition that you're, you're, you sample. But for states that are in that sample, um, you're going to update your, your current estimate by taking the max of your previous estimate and the, this functional that, that we had before where we're looking at the reward differences and then the, the distance between the unique next states. And so I can show that if you sample the, the, all pairs of states and all actions infinitely often, and you start with the everywhere zero metric, then this, this method is guaranteed to converge to the bisimulation metric almost surely, which is kind of nice. Um, and it, so I ran some experiments looking at MDPs of different sizes, and you can see that um, we get some pretty significant uh, computation savings using our, the sampling method as opposed to using the, the traditional dynamic programming method. So that's kind of cool. But it still has some things that, that make it kind of difficult to work with. In particular, you still re have to sample all the states uh, um, infinitely often. So that means you need full enumerability of the states because this is essentially a tabular representation of your metric, which makes large state space really hard to, to deal with. And you, it just, you can't deal with continuous state spaces in, with this setup. So what I started considering is what if instead of looking at this tabular representation of states, we look at um, some k-dimensional representation of the state space that is a bit more general. And then we apply this function approximator psi that's uh, parameterized by theta, um, where it receives two concatenations of uh, the concatenation of two state representations. So that's why we have um, 2k here. And then it just gives us an estimate of, of our bisimulation metric. So for instance, if we have a state representation that's just two-dimensional, like the xy coordinates, we can concatenate two state representations, pass it through like a simple one-layer network, and then get our, our estimate. And this is what I'm going to be using for, for the experiments. So um, given a, a pair of states that, that are not equal to each other, um, we're going to define this target which is, you can see it's very similar to the update function that I introduced before. It's basically taking the max of our previous estimate 
and the update uh, function that, that, that we're, uh, I've already introduced a few times. Um, so I'm using the same trick from, that was introduced in DQN where I'm using this uh, theta hat, uh, theta bar, sorry, which is a target network that gets updated uh, less frequently and this uh, helps add stability to, to the algorithm. Um, so if we do sample pairs of states that are the same, we're going to force the target to be zero because uh, these networks don't really know about pseudometrics and so they might assign non-zero distances to the same state, which would be unfortunate. Um, so now that we have this target, we can define our loss as simply the, the mean squared error between our target and our current estimate and we can learn in this way. So this is fine for single uh, samples of, of, of pairs of transitions, but typically nowadays when we're dealing with GPUs and that type of thing, we're dealing with mini batches. And so if you sample, say from a replay buffer, a set of uh, states and a set of tr rewards, um, you can, in the, in the paper I have some, some matrix operations where you can essentially take a, a batch of size n and come up with a batch of size n squared for, for applying this update. And you can, I won't go through the details, but essentially you can redefine your target for, for mini batches in a similar way and have a loss that, that operates with mini batches. And so now you can train these things on GPUs and, and it works pretty efficiently. So I'm using this, this hyperparameter beta that's essentially, you can think of this as an unrolling horizon. So it starts off at zero, which means that you'll initially only be looking at, at uh, differences in immediate reward and it slowly goes all the way to one. So it's essentially looking further and further in the future. And the reason I do this is because if you remember the dynamic programming uh, method, you start with uh, just looking at immediate rewards and then you slowly kind of look further and further into the future. So if we don't have this beta term, um, if we start with a poor initialization, then we have a uh, high likelihood of, of diverging. And so this adds a lot of stability to the training process. Okay, so for em evaluating this empirically, um, because I'm dealing with a potentially continuous state space, it's hard to have ground truth for it because we can't compute the bisimulation metrics exactly for continuous states. So I start with this simple domain that I had before. It's just a 31 state MDP. Um, but what's nice about this is I can compute the bisimulation metric exactly. And what I'm showing here is the distance from this top left state to all the other states. And you can see it captures some, some um, patterns and, and some um, regularities in, in the system. So you can see that the distance between this state and this, this other state here at the, in the bottom room is, is quite low. So they're physically separate, but by simulation captures a notion of behavioral proximity, not, not necessarily physical proximity. And you can see a similar situation here when you're comparing the hallway state to all other states in the system. Um, even though these states in, the, in, in this row are nearby in physical distance, they're, they're quite far away in terms of behavioral distance. So this becomes my ground truth. And what I do is I represent these states rather than, than in this tabular fashion where I give them an ID. I project them onto the XY plane and so I give each cell um, the XY coordinates of, of the center of the cell. So for instance, the bottom left uh, cell would have XY coordinates 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, and so what's nice about this is that now I can add noise to the sampling and so essentially instead of having a single point for each cell, I have this cloud, this yellow cloud of points. And so I've essentially converted this this uh, simple tabular representation of, of the state into this continuous state MDP by, by adding this noise and using this representation. And so because I have the ground truth for this, uh, for this MDP, when I was considering the, the tabular representation, I can actually compute um, the error of, of my approximant, and this is what I'm showing here. Um, so you can see uh, in terms of absolute uh, difference, it's quite high, which is uh, performing pretty poorly, but this is not completely unexpected because we have, we're essentially training on a moving target. We don't have a stable point of reference for what the metric should be. And um, because we have this maximization operator, th there's a tendency to kind of move these distances further apart than, than what they should be. But what we're really interested in is in the relative distances between states because if we're going to be doing state aggregation, the absolute value doesn't really matter that much. We can just scale things. And so if you normalize the distances and compare the, the normalized distances between our ground truth and um, our approximate, we can see that we get pretty low error, which is quite nice. The other thing that's kind of nice is if we don't add noise, um, so if we just represent each state by its XY coordinate without adding that noise, we actually get worse results. We get more variance and we get worse approximation errors. So the noise is adding, uh, I think is, is acting as a form of regularizer for, um, for, for our training process. Um, so another experiment I did is that for each cell I sampled 100 points um, and then I computed the bisimulation uh, approximant for between all pairs of points and I applied a simple clustering algorithm. 
um, to try to see what we get. And so we get some things that, that do kind of make sense. So the hallway states are all grouped together. These orange states are kind of states that are fairly close to the goal states. Um, again, this clustering algorithm is, is very vanilla, so it's likely that if you use a more sophisticated method, you'd get better, um, better clusterings. But this is quite encouraging in that it's actually learning something meaningful. Um, okay, so that's what I have so far. There's a lot of work that, that's going on with this right now. One of the things I'm interested um, is obviously getting rid of the deterministic uh, assumption and, and making this work for stochastic or quasi-stochastic transitions. Uh, perhaps we can use replay buffers to estimate these transitions. Um, one thing I'm really interested in is seeing if we can use this by simulation loss as a regularizer for, for learning representations in the sense that um, the Euclidean distance or the cosine distance between two representations uh, approximates the by simulation distance. So then there's a notion of semantic proximity in the representation space. And I think also there's, there's potentially some, um, some uses for doing rep replay buffer compression. So if you have a replay buffer and at some point you can use your by simulation estimate and just kind of go through that and, and group together states that are similar, you might get some savings that way. Um, but there's a lot more that, that we're looking at right now. We're working on a NURP submission, which has some more um, theory and some more experiments, and uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. So thank you very much. And I think we still have, do we have time for questions, if there are any? And if there are no questions, that's also okay. <laughs> I think you didn't have a question from the chat. Um, yeah. It's sort of serving the same role. Um, so essentially, it, it's a multiplicative term. So gamma is still the discount factor that comes with whatever your program um, it is you're considering. The beta, uh, the beta serves as essentially, so if you have a poor initialization, and for instance, you start with assigning high distances for states just because of the initialization, because you have this maximization operator, that's going to overpower the, the differences in rewards, and then this is just going to diverge and shoot off because you, you no longer, there's no process that, that brings it back down. So th this beta term, what it's essentially doing, it, it's in essence saying, I don't trust my, my current estimate right now. So rewards, we know that's coming from the environment, so that we can trust. And so initially, we're only going to look at immediate rewards, and we're going to start with our, basically rein in our estimates into this immediate reward, and then slowly we're going to start unfolding this beta because we start trusting our, our estimates more and more. And so there's some work, not for by simulation metrics, but just for reinforcement learning in general by Nanjiang's group from a few years ago, where they use a similar idea of this uh, unrolling horizon, so they have another multiplicative term. I don't know if they call it beta, but, but essentially a term that they multiply the, the, the gamma term with. So it's like Yes, 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 so there's a schedule. So beta goes from, from zero all the way to one. So at the end, you essentially have the, the traditional R plus gamma. Uh, uh, formulation, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, Right now, it's just a fixed schedule, so I know how long I'm going to train for. Oops, sorry. So I split it up into into epochs, and and so just after a certain epoch, I, I have like a an amount by which I increase beta, and so I just increase it, and it. Um, yeah, I think it's just linear right now, so it just kind of goes up linearly from from zero to one. But it, it's true. It, uh, there's probably much better ways to to do this because some some uh, systems might lend themselves better to to have early good approximants uh, compared to others. So, yeah. So that's that's a good point. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>